uh, webinar series is brought to you by the IDEAS ECP project in collaboration with the Argon Oak Ridge uh, Computing Facilities and also NERSC. Uh, I am Osni Marcus from the Lawrence Berkeley Lab and Ashley Barker from Oak Ridge and I will be the hosts for this webinar. Uh, today's speaker is, uh, is Elaine Rayburn from Sandia National Laboratories. Elaine is a principal member of the technical staff in Applied Cognitive Science at Sandia, uh, where she works on, uh, her work focuses on transmedia learning and immersive simulations. She was a fellow of the European Research Consortium for Informatics and Mathematics, where she worked with the software teams in, in Germany in France uh, um, and in France. Elaine holds a PhD in intercultural communication with an emphasis in human computer interaction from the, uh, she got the, the, her degree at the University of New Mexico. And also uh, she has a, a, a certificate in modeling and simulation of behavioral cybersecurity uh, from the University of Central Florida. And she's a member, Elaine is a member of the IDEAS ECP uh, project. project uh, uh, and today she'll talk about on demand learning for better scientific software, how to use resources and technology to optimize your productivity. Elaine, please. Thank you, Osni. Thank you all very much for joining me this afternoon. This is really a pleasure for me. I want to thank uh, Ashley and Osni for inviting me to give a webinar this afternoon. And I'd also like to thank the Department of Energy Office of Science and uh, the NNSA uh, for uh, supporting our work in the X-Scale Computing Project. So as Osni said, I'm a social scientist. And actually, what I have been working on for most of my career is immersion. And that's what I'd like to talk a little bit more about today. You see, um, the beginning of my career, I started working on standalone systems uh, for different types of user groups. And that included the use of games and virtual worlds and simulations. And then over the years, what I've come to understand is that in order for us to have the, the most efficient and most productive learning, what we need to do is connect each of those standalone experiences in a coherent and cohesive story. And that is what led me to uh, focus more of my work on transmedia learning. So it's actually looking at connecting all of those training and learning experiences so that we can be the, the most efficient and effective learners possible. So this is what you'll be able to expect from the, uh, from the uh, webinar today. I have gone ahead and taken this um, large body of work and condensed it into about 15 minute sections. I've embedded a lot of multimedia resources in the webinar slides for you uh, for later for deeper exploration. And unfortunately, the webinar would not support me to uh, show you the videos, but you can go ahead and look at them later. What you can also expect is to walk away from the webinar with a transmedia learning framework and the use of some examples on GitHub and Python. And remember, transmedia learning or learning in general is um, you know, adult learning, we're going to focus on motivated learners. So I'm going to give you a call to action at the end of the webinar, and you'll also have opportunities between each section to ask questions. And if you don't have any questions, I'm going to ask questions for us. Okay, so here are the learning objectives for the next hour. What we'll be able to do by the end of the hour is you should be able to define what I mean by learning in the wild. And you'll also be able to identify how to make your learning stick, or that is how to learn effectively and um, learn concepts that so you don't have to relearn them all the time. With a transmedia learning framework, uh, you'll be able to understand how that makes your own um, uh, personal learning more productive. And you'll also know how to create a personalized framework in six easy steps. So that's what we should expect by the end of the hour. So for this um, next hour, this is how I have set up our um, sections. I'm going to spend most of my time talking about the challenge and uh, productive learning habits. Then I will introduce the transmedia learning framework 
and then spend a little more time just concluding. But that's really just to wrap up and introduce you to some more um, uh, resources. And I'm going to make some assumptions about you all, uh, the learners. I am making the assumption that since you are participating in this webinar or watching it later, that you're motivated, that you want to learn, that you're a self-starter, and that you're probably not afraid of a challenge. I'm also going to make the assumption that you may be coming at this webinar for several different purposes. Maybe it's to make your own learning more productive, or maybe uh, there's uh, something that you need to actually uh, help your teams learn um, in HPC. And um, it might also be that there's a personal reason for you to want to come to understand uh, a little bit more about this topic. Maybe you're a lifelong learner or you have um, uh, some, someone in your organization that you'd like to either train or your kids. In any way, um, you can always reach out to us here at IDEAS. We are happy to help you. In particular, uh, reach out to me. I'm very happy to help you set up your transmedia learning frameworks for yourselves or your organizations. So let's get started with the challenge. The challenge that we see today is that we have a lot of different technologies that we can choose from for learning. And the learning that I'm really going to focus on is learning outside of a formal classroom setting. So this is really about informal learning, learning um, on your own time or on the job. You're all busy professionals, so we don't have a lot of time to learn. We have a lot of different tasks that we're doing. And I wish that our technologies were laid out as neatly as it's depicted here in this image. But actually, it looks more like this. This is what we experience every day. We have a myriad of technologies and uh, different ways to connect with information that are not coherent. It's just all out there. They're disparate, one-off apps or um, different types of um, uh, experiences or media, and it's really up to the end user to make sense of all of this information and to actually um, learn and, and be able to distill what's important from all of the media. To add on top of the myriad devices and media that we see out there, our habits are also changing. And so what those of us in the, um, the profession are, are learning is that we are starting to use uh, second and third screens more. Um, we are also using more parallel worlds in the sense that um, we are more attuned to story uh, and um, we, we are even looking and seeking uh, story out in our um, entertainment experiences. And now the real world is just one other platform that we use to connect with information and each other. And these findings were based on a study that was done on the future of storytelling. It's a little bit dated from 2012, but I like the findings in this particular study and they haven't really changed uh, that much since then. If anything, we're seeing um, more studies that are starting to corroborate uh, these, uh, uh, these findings. The other thing we need to keep in mind is that our cognition is increasingly distributed. And um, here I'm calling to mind the um, approach used in cognitive psychology called cog uh, distributed cognition. And this was originally brought about by Edward Hutchinson. And in his um, uh, approach, we store information not only in our uh, minds, but in the minds of others, our environment, in devices, and so really that's what is meant by our cognition being distributed. Uh, so for example, you don't need to remember a phone number because it's already in your smartphone. So you just need to know how to go to your contact list to retrieve it. Um, and then that's where you have that information about uh, the phone number, for example. And I'm sure you can think of a number of different uh, examples, especially in your own jobs how you rely on other teams and on individuals in your teams with different um, expertise uh, to come together to form that, um, the, the cognitive expertise of that particular group. And the last thing to remember here is that our learning is actually 
24-7 and connected and social, we spend over the course of our lifetime more than 95% of our time out of the classroom. And so if we're not taking advantage of all of those informal learning opportunities, then we're actually, um, we're not really maximizing our opportunities to learn. And so this is why I have really been um, led to this notion of transmedia learning. Uh, I, as I said, I've found over the course of my career uh, in developing um, immersive uh, training environments and immersive learning environments that the key is actually to be able to connect what is learned from each of these disparate um, ex experiences so that someone, uh, the learner, doesn't have the onus of making sense of it all on their own. And one of the ways that we can do this is to, first of all, represent that core experience, whatever the learner is learning at the time, over multiple media and over multiple platforms and engage that person in a story. And here, um, what I mean by story, as you'll see later, doesn't necessarily need to be a novel or uh, when you think of the word story, it's not necessarily just entertainment. What we're doing is um, you know, we can even empl employ different techniques such as the agile technique of user stories uh, to uh, this idea of connecting experiences. So I'm hoping that this is a key takeaway that, uh, that you'll take away from our um, webinar. So for those of you who have come to the webinar to either understand a little bit more about uh, what types of uh, training environments you can design or um, what types of learning environments are out there. I normally show this slide when I am uh, discussing this with designers of either training events or, or learning events. But I would like to share this with you as well because I want you to be aware of the terminology that's out there uh, just so that you have an idea of why transmedia learning is a good way to learn um, outside of a formal classroom. So if you think about multimedia and blended learning and transmedia learning, the main differences here is that multimedia can really be seen as a package, that a multimedia environment is one that includes several different types of media, but it does not necessarily um, have anything, it may not necessarily be distributed across multiple media. It can be, but it's not always done that way. Blended learning is another term that you might hear in um, education. Blended learning is really about um, focusing on augmenting um, a, a formal learning environment either with technology or flipping it somehow to include technology. Again, the emphasis on blended learning is that it is still instructor-led, so it is still rather formalized. Transmedia learning, on the other hand, is for informal learning, meaning that there is no instructor and it is the uh, learner that goes through the learning in a manner that is self-paced. And this type of learning, transmedia learning, allows the learner to uh, engage with content emotionally, to uh, use social media to create user-generated content, um, to actually um, interact with the core concepts from different media. And so in this sense, uh, this is the type of um, this is a type of learning that you can employ outside of the formal classroom to, to really engage yourself and immerse yourself in whatever content it is that, that you want to explore. So why is transmedia learning and transmedia so addictive? This idea of, of being um, so immersed in something that you just uh, get so, con you, you're, as, as a consumer of, of uh, content, you just get so excited. Well, one of the reasons why transmedia storytelling is so addictive, this storytelling that, that occurs across different platforms, is because of the dopamine. And here, what I'm really trying to focus on is that technology developers today understand the concept of activation. They understand that actually dopamine is um, 
activating our, um, our, our seeking behaviors and then our pleasure behaviors. So what it's doing is, as for example, you get a notification on your phone, uh, that notification is activating that, um, that, seeking, um, that seeking goal-directed behavior. And as you look at it, then you're rewarded. And so this idea of having instant gratification is something that actually um, media, those that design media, especially entertainment or marketing, make a lot of, um, they use very much in, in their designs. The idea here is that we should be able to do the same thing in education. And to do that, we need to be able to employ storytelling. Storytelling also being very important because we've got basically two systems. And as soon as you hear a concept that's been laid out to you, you've got your limbic system that is making a judgment very quickly about what it's hearing. And it comes right before that rational judgment. And so if I can create content or deliver content that's going to engage you in your system too, then that's really going to stick a lot more. And then the cross-platform narrative allows me to engage with you at different intervals throughout your day. So for example, you might be engaging with the mobile phone while you're um, waiting in line at the post office. As soon as you get back to your desk, you're back at your laptop or your desktop. Then when you go home, uh, you might be um, watching uh, videos online. And so if I can create learning content that is going to engage with you across these different platforms, then you will have more exposure to that content. And so as we go through the webinar, think of yourself as the designer of your own transmedia learning framework. And you should be curating and thinking about ways that you can set yourself up for success and for productive learning by utilizing all of the different um, platforms. So here's my recap slide for this particular section. The challenge here is to create learning in the wild that is both purposeful and productive. And by that, what I mean is that we have to be able to connect these disparate pieces of knowledge that you might acquire. And you can see from this graphic here, you probably interact with, I would say, most if not all of these uh, different uh, types of media. Uh, a digital friend, if you think you don't interact with that, if you have ever gone to a website to um, make, uh, let's say, your airline reservations and you have um, interacted with the chatbot, that is um, what I am considering in this particular case a type of digital friend. So. I think that basically that is the challenge. Uh, let's see, does anyone have any questions about it? Okay, if there are no questions at this point, what I'd like you to think about for the next section is to think about the challenge that I've presented. How is this content new for you if it is? If it's not, then um, how can you take what you know to the next section? While I'm talking about the next section, which is productive learning habits, try to think about ways that uh, you may be able to bring those learning habits into your daily life or ways that you already um, bring them into your daily life. So now we're going to talk about um, one of my favorite topics, which is ways to actually make this learning stick. And I, I like, hear like, like yes. Sorry, sorry. <clears throat> before we move away, there was one question that kind of came in. In the last graphic, do you have recommendations for engaging learners in all of those different arenas? Let me see if I can go back to the graphic that the, this one here. Uh, yes. Um, I do, yes, that one, that's it. Yes, I do have um, different um, strategies for engaging learners in these different areas. And you'll notice there is one here which is called assess. This is assessment. I'm actually glad a question was asked because it reminded me that 
one of the most important things, and you'll see this in the next section, here I call it assessment, but as a learner, as you are engaging with different media, you're immersed in your content, you'll see that one of the best ways to make your learning stick is to assess yourself, assess and reflect. And so what we talk about um, um, for the rest of the webinar could also apply to how I would individually engage learners in each of these different areas. And I'm happy to go into that into more detail um, offline. So thank you for that question. I really appreciate it. Okay. So, Making It Stick, if you haven't um, read this book, if you're not uh, familiar with it, uh, this is um, a really interesting uh, book on the science of successful learning. Uh, it's also a very good um, audio book if you prefer that. Uh, it's from uh, 2014, but um, I, I really like uh, what the, the book has to say. So what I'm going to do is really just, these are strategies that you do not need to apply to a, a technology-mediated uh, tool or you know, any type of um, experience. This is just really, these are good um, habits to get into and these would be great strategies uh, for you when you are just making your learning stick um, as you go about your informal learning. So, the first idea here I'd like to talk about is going wide. And in um, the industry, in learning science in particular, there's a lot of discussion um, about, and, and you may have heard some discussion about learning styles. There really is no empirical evidence to support that. And what I like about the way that these authors have uh, talked about uh, learning styles is go wide. If you really, really want to make uh, your learning stick, then um, go, go outside of your comfort zone. And the reason why is because if learning is harder and if learning is stronger, it lasts longer. So I know that sounds really counterintuitive. I'm going to say it again because it's really an important point. But if your learning is harder, if it's stronger, and if it lasts longer, then it will be more productive learning. So instead of learning something each time, you know, every month learning it uh, over and over because you, you forgot that item because you're, what you're doing is rereading something. Try a different strategy. Go outside of your comfort zone and uh, try many different ways to learn. And so um, that is one of my favorite um, approaches. Second, and really I think that ties to that is desirable difficulty. We use this a lot in simulation. And um, here what we're talking about is pushing you a little bit outside of your box, making what you're ultimately doing is you're expanding your comfort zone. This is a great strategy. You want to be able to um, not make it so hard that it's frustrating, but it can't be too easy either. You've got to find that zone. And Sitsa Mahali talks about that zone as flow. And when you're in this desirable difficulty where things are kind of hard, um, it actually can be fun. And so this is, again, the area where um, you are really trying to engage yourself. You, wanna, you want to release that dopamine. You want that, um, that dopamine loop uh, to, to be activated as you are uh, learning on your own. Because if, you're, if the technologies that you have around you are, are causing that type of a response, then your learning has got to have a fighting chance, which means you've got to make it interesting and fun for yourself. Another way to do this is to self-quiz. Part of the reason why I asked you before we started this section to think about what you might be listening, to try to contextualize it into your own situation, it's a way, in a sense, to try to create a self-quiz for you. So before you read a particular section, before you hear a podcast, before you um, play a game, quiz yourself. Ask yourself what it is that you expect to get out of it, um, what you bring to the table, and what content uh, you might already know uh, about uh, that particular area. Another um, one I like is this spaced retrieval. This is really great because uh, what this does is, it, is spaced retrieval or any type of spaced learning uh, is, is a type of learning where you actually embed 
uh, spaces or time in between learning so that you actually allow yourself time to forget it just a little bit. And so that type of space learning is actually re reinforces the learning. So if you learn something, um, you want to be able to spend some time learning something and then give yourself a break. Go out, play tennis, um, let a few days pass, then go back and to that material again and um, try to um, see if you can retrieve that information again. Now for you, you may find when you are first learning something that a day or two is too long. You may need to shorten it a couple of hours. And so this is actually very, um, this is a, a rather, I would say, um, personal um, way to figure something out. You'll have to just do it by trial and error. Uh, to elaborate is actually the ability to be able to discuss what it is that you're learning. So elaborate on things that you're, you're learning. Talk to people about them. Um, be able to describe and um, be able to uh, articulate something that uh, you're learning. That's another way to make it stick. Space practice is like spaced retrieval. But here, what you're doing is you're actually, you're spacing out the self-quizzing. So you're not only retrieving the information, but you're spacing it out. You're spacing out the practice of self-quizzing. You are spacing out, if, if what you're learning is a type of um, behavior, uh, then you're spacing out the, the performance of that behavior. Um, and so this, again, is very useful. Interleaving your learning, that is actually something that's employed a lot by a lot of different domains. And this is learning different things at the same time. They may be related. They don't have to be completely different. Um, but what you're doing is, you are learning more than one thing at the same time and, and increasing the, the chances and the opportunities for each of those domain areas to influence the other in your learning. And that is a, actually a, a really, um, uh, it, it, it can be actually a lot of fun when you talk about immersion, just thinking about different ways that you might engage yourself uh, with that topic. Generation is actually, um, trying to solve a problem before you've actually been taught how to do it or before you learned how to do it. So this is getting at some experiential learning. Puzzle through the unknown. Try to see if you can figure it out. A lot of gamers do this. Uh, this is a great habit to get into, um, to, to just try to puzzle through it and, and see if it's working for you. And then another um, really uh, good habit uh, that you can actually employ in a lot of different aspects of um, your uh, life or your, your work is reflection. And reflection is really the ability to review. Uh, it can be a situation, a meeting, it can be what you're learning. Review what you just learned. Uh, what is it that, um, you know, when you self-quiz, what did you do well? Uh, what could you have done better? How will you now uh, change your, um, your learning uh, because um, you are actually um, going to, you know, uh, you're, you're iterating as you go. So you're actually improving what you do. And so that's how reflection can also help here. Some of the other habits of successful learning are the ideas of self-directed learning and self-regulated learning. And, you know, self-directed learning and self-regulated learning are, are terms that come from uh, the learning sciences, self-directed learning normally, uh, you know, comes out of uh, adult learning. And this really speaks to um, having the ability to um, practice your own learning outside of a traditional environment, um, being able to uh, freely design your learning. So you really need to have a self-directed learning approach when you're designing uh, transmedia learning for yourself. Um, but self-regulated learning is also very important. And self-regulated learning usually refers to um, learning that uh, might occur in a formal classroom here. What they're looking at is, is basically your, you know, your micro-level behaviors, whether you're able to monitor your own learning um, and uh, regulate whether you are uh, learning well or not. But Really the most important thing here to think about is that in our case, you want both. You want both self-directed and self-regulated learning. And that's because both of these behaviors are goal-directed. They utilize your metacognition. 
They require active participation. And really, it's about intrinsic motivation. And all of that is necessary uh, for what it is that we want to accomplish with designing a transmedia learning framework for ourselves. So here's an example that I just want to provide as um, what I've been able to do for um, the Department of Defense. Uh, now, this is a, um, a proof of concept. It was for the ethos of uh, warrior athlete. And so here I made the point of using the word ethos. And what I would like to suggest is that even as a learner, if you are engaging in learning on the job or, you know, outside of your formal classroom or if you're learning um, because you're a lifelong learner, what you're really doing is you're contributing to your ethos. It's part of who you are. So I don't look at learning as the addition of um, a, uh, you know, a skill that, um, uh, I don't look at it as a short-term thing. I, whenever I, I learn something, I try to put my all into it, and I think of it as a, a way to contribute to my ethos. And so in this case, the ethos of um, warrior athlete, you can see how this transmedia learning environment includes the use of graphic novels, uh, following um, very influential people in social media, that, um, like the Surgeon General, with uh, comments about health, uh, having um, access to short videos that can be watched from mobile devices, engaging in virtual environments, which um, are games that um, constitute training. Um, also, in this case, one of the core experiences being the, the very real and physical uh, training that one has to have to be a um, warrior athlete. Uh, engaging with websites about nutrition, tracking their own um, um, uh, physiology, uh, getting now into the ideas of the, the quantitative self, and then, you know, some computer-based training. And then really in, in each of these different areas and combined, we're looking at assessment in, at both ends of the spectrum. So assessment of the learner as you're going through these different activities, but then also assessment um, as a whole. And so this being really important to understand what is the best way to deliver, um, you know, this type of content in throughout your daily life so that uh, you can maximize your learning and be the most productive you can be. So those are the first two sections. Does anyone have a question? Hey, Elaine, I don't see anything in the um, Google Doc at the moment. Okay, great, thank you. So then I have a question for you. Um, think about what, uh, the, what learning habit I just spoke about that seemed like one that you could do that isn't something you're already doing. Think about something completely new, something that would um, be outside of your comfort zone, and See if I have identified it in the next section on transmedia learning framework. And uh, think about your willingness to, to try it. Now, it doesn't have to be in these examples of GitHub or Python, but um, just think about just the different strategies and if there is one that pops out to you that you would be willing to try. All right, so in this next section, what we're going to do is talk about how to create your transmedia learning framework. And this again, this is for a motivated learner. So if your goal is to uh, write some code really quickly for um, some, something that you are working on, um, then maybe you don't need to set up a transmedia learning framework for that. You might want to visit one of those resources. But if your goal is to actually learn the topic because you want to add a building block to your ethos, then a transmedia learning framework might be something you would consider. So if you do that, then the way to think about your transmedia learning framework is to start with your story. And I know this sounds counterintuitive. You may be thinking, ah, you know, I'm not a storyteller. It's not really about telling a long story. It's about knowing what your goal is. So if you're going to learn Git, have a goal. Why are you learning it? 
make it productive. And you can start by setting it, setting it up. Your goal helps you set up why you're engaging with that content. Remember, to make it stick, you want it to be a little hard. So there's got to be some conflict and challenge there. There will be some cognitive dissonance. It shouldn't be really easy. If it's too easy, then you may want to step up your game a little bit. Once you start to get into that groove and get into the flow, the dopamine loop is going to be going and it's going to be, uh, it'll be fun. And then, you know, you have the satisfaction of uh, learning something and that's where you will feel some reward. So that's the resolution. Now this is actually a storytelling arc. And uh, there's a lot of information that you can read about storytelling arcs. Um, I like to talk about storytelling arcs and also the hero's journey, which um, I've used before in setting up the um, uh, warrior athlete, for example. Um, there, it's uh, really much more complex, but um, there um, are different stories that will take you through this exact, um, uh, I would say, cycle. So just keep that in mind. As we move into the transmedia learning framework then, after you've got your goal, this is what we want to think about doing. You want to set it up so that you can explore, study, sharpen, master, and share. And think about how you would do this in your daily life. So it's outside of a formal classroom. Of course, you could do these things in the class as well, but outside of the formal class, as I mentioned earlier, you may have um, a few moments throughout the day where um, you've got some downtime. It's maybe 15 minutes here or there, not enough time to really get involved in um, you know, looking at a simulation, but it may be just enough time to explore some videos. Uh, or uh, you, may, um, you may know that um, you're going to be on travel and you won't have access to certain items, but you might be able to um, you know, look at different other uh, platforms. So you want to make sure that you keep all of this in mind as you're setting it up. And so the way that I have this, if you think about that story arc that I just talked about, where we went from setup, conflict and challenge, climax and resolution, think about that arc. And now look at this way that I've set this up. You're, you're first exploring something. You're not really 100% um, committed. Then you start to study. That's where you're really starting to get into it. You're sharpening your skills. At this point, uh, sharpening, you've already learned something. You're going to sharpen uh, what you already know. In a problem-solving simulation or some type of activity that requires performance on your part, now you're in the mastering mode. And then finally, the resolution is sharing. So. By the time you've mastered something, share your ideas, share what you've mastered. Why? Because this also allows you to elaborate and to, um, to describe and discuss the things that are learning, which is going to make your learning stick even more. So let me now talk about uh, these technologies a little bit. And I know that um, I'm not going to assume that uh, everybody knows everything, so I'm just going to say a few words about each. In terms of the videos, what you may want to do here is to seek out these very short videos. For example, you may find that um, subscribing to YouTube channels is a good way for you to get content that, is, uh, that allows you to maximize maybe two minutes of your time, three minutes of your time, etc. So you don't have to think of it as going back and watching a, an hour webinar. That would be more along the lines of, I would say, study, where you're going back for um, an hour or you're now reading posts and blogs. Again, that can be done in a short amount of time. Some of these blog posts are five-minute reads. Um, you'll want to engage in these interactive exercises, uh, like games. And I don't know if everyone knows what a MOOC is. A MOOC is a um, massively open online course. And I'll say a little bit more about that later. Uh, podcasts and audiobooks are also good to sharpen your skills. Again, utilizing a different channel. So you might be watching videos. Uh, you might be 
reading, those are visual. Now you're exercising your audio, auditory channel, problem solving and simulations, playing games, practicing writing code. These are all great ways to um, safely uh, discover what it is that you know and don't know. And then, of course, uh, following social media. Quite honestly, I use social media, especially Twitter, to curate content a lot of times and to get information from the gurus. So now we're going to talk about the six easy steps. I'm going to break my own rule and I'm going to ask if there are any questions right now. Okay, so we have about 19 more minutes and um, I'm going to, in 19 minutes, um, discuss the Transmedia Learning Framework in six steps and then conclude the webinar. So as I said, step number one was identify your goals. That was what uh, we did um, a few slides ago where we thought about the story arc. So think about the story arc and then you want to create your story. Here, what I'm suggesting is that you use the Agile um, user story format. Here I have a user story that I created as a casual user of GitHub. I want more GitHub tutorials and tips so that it becomes easier for me to recall functionality. Now, in creating this user story, I'm a motivated user, so keep that in mind. Now that I have my user story, I'm a, first of all, I know that I'm a casual user. I want tutorials and tips, and for me, what's important is recalling the functionality because I don't want to have to go back and relearn certain functionality all the time. I want to get better at that. So the next thing I would do is identify those learning opportunities throughout my day. Think about the duration, the frequency, and the modality. So here, again, you're trying to increase your learning so that you're learning as much as possible. I'm not saying 24-7, but um, instead of looking at Facebook, why not think about um, some way that you could use that platform to learn about GitHub uh, or to engage with whatever topic it is that you're learning. In this case, the example is GitHub. The next step would be to, be to identify the technology and the media that fit your daily life. So I spoke a little bit about massively open online courses. These are actually uh, free platforms. There are a lot of different courses that you can take. If you're not familiar with the MOOC, I, I highly recommend that, um, that you check them out. Uh, you, just, you can sign up, uh, you get an account, and then many courses are free. Some courses will have certificates and they will ask for, um, you know, they will be paid courses, but not all of them are paid. Uh, and later on, there's a, um, a MOOC for GitHub um, that, um, that I found for you. Another technology you might want to use is Twitter. Again, I, I like it for curating content um, for those, um, you know, few moments that I have. It allows me to, to just keep abreast of different topics. Mobile applications can be useful. Um, podcasts and eBooks uh, you may not be as familiar with, but these, uh, of course, you could download to your mobile device and uh, and you know read books while you're on the go. Now, the best part about this is that really you get to curate your own content, and so this actually might be for some of you the hardest part. And the way that you would want to curate your content is by thinking about um, word of mouth. So if, you've, if you're trying to learn GitHub, for example, you might ask your colleagues how they went about learning or any resources that they uh, recommend. Now, I've um, recommended some resources for you um, in the webinar. You can also do advanced searches. Uh, so, for example, you may want to set up uh, some alerts for yourself so that you can um, uh, see any relevant content that um, pertains to, to whatever it is that you're trying to learn, and then also look at reviews of that content so that you can um, be a little more confident about what you're learning. Uh, make sure that it comes from a credible source. And as you plan your transmedia learning framework, make sure you use a learning science strategy. And so you'll notice that um, throughout this webinar, there have been certain words that um, are hyperlinks. And so these actually, if you go to these, I've already prepared these um, 
uh, links for you so that you can go out and learn a little more deeply about uh, these different topics. So as you plan your transmedia learning uh, framework, make sure you set up reminders for yourself. For, you know you are actually creating your own immersive environment. So remind yourself to, to actually go online and, and look at your content. Uh, you might prepare some quizzes for yourself in advance and then email them to yourself uh, at different times. Uh, you know, set it up so that you get that email and you take that quiz. Uh, find other ways to motivate and reward yourself. So let's take a look at um, two use cases. One is Python and the other one is uh, GitHub and Git. So I'm not going to go into each of the different um, resources that I curated for you, <clears throat> but I do want to point out that uh, you can find this transmedia learning framework um, on the Better Scientific software site. And so there are, of course, uh, hyperlinks uh, for you to follow here. And, and each of these links will take you out to uh, Jupyter Notebooks and um, each of the other resources. In the videos, what I did for uh, the, an end user that's trying to learn Python with MOOCs, games, and podcasts. Maybe that's a particular framework that a person has chosen. Um, I've started off with the exploration, which is watching some videos that are actually really, um, they're short and they are very energetic. Uh, so these are YouTubers that are talking about Python and um, in short snippets. Um, and these can be very interesting ways to engage with the topic, um, sorry, to engage with the topic uh, if you only have a short amount of time. And then we also have uh, some longer um, topics, like you've got some great um, videos um, given by the national labs. And then we have also some Python tutorials in GitHub um, and other workshops and uh, Jupyter Notebooks. These are websites where you can go and study. Again, these are actually really great resources for you to get started in Python. Uh, for mobile, for you to sharpen your skill set, um, there is a podcast I found, Talk Python to Me. It's actually pretty interesting. And then uh, there are Python quizzes out online, uh, especially for beginners. And um, the game Code Wars might be one that you might want to try if you're learning Python. That's for problem solving and simulations. And then in uh, social media, you may want to follow some of these um, Python gurus uh, that, uh, you know, not only give a lot of good information about events uh, or uh, different things that are going on, but they also uh, tweet about um, different um, aspects of Python that um, they're interested in. In the second um, uh, example, we've got GitHub, and here you have a transmedia learning framework um, for MOOCs, flashcards, and um, videos. So here, actually, we have a lot of content that uh, the HPC community has uh, developed. Uh, so, for example, in the watch videos, you've got a longer intermediate um, Git webinar, um, and then also uh, a YouTube channel on um, Git tutorials, and that's called um, Advanced Techniques with Rachel. For um, studying, you may want to engage in a three-week long course. And so the MOOC is a three-week long course that is self-paced and online. And the real beauty about a MOOC for everyone who engages with a MOOC except those that uh, design them is actually that um, when you take uh, a self-paced course and you're not getting any credit for it necessarily, you have access to all of the content and resources you don't have to go through it, um, excuse me, you don't have to step through uh, the content in the MOOC uh, sequ sequentially. If you see a topic that is most relevant to you, go to it directly. So engage in what you need at that moment. You may not need to engage with everything in the MOOC. So the MOOC, you can use the MOOC in a way that uh, will maximize your learning and the amount of time that you have. Um, Definitely leverage the, the forum and leverage the, uh, the quizzing and the assessment. These are all really great ways to uh, engage in a more course-like structure if you're finding that that's what you really need. And then <clears throat> for um, 
for Git in particular. IDEA CCP has a great uh, tutorial and refer reference collection on the BSSW website. And of course, you can also find the um, transmedia learning frameworks there as well. Uh, for sharpening your skills from mobile, mobile device, there are uh, 10 question quizzes and um, mobile apps, flashcard apps. There's the uh, Git cheat sheet. And then um, also other ways that you can make your own flashcards as you go. For problem solving, for mastering Git, there are tutorials and also games uh, that you can, can actually work with. And um, this is really to get you to to demonstrate your um, to demonstrate what you're learning. So get out there and actually it's more performance based. You have to just do it. And then finally, again, social media sharing. Sharing allows for elaboration. Um, and that would be, you know, following GitHub on Twitter or sharing your ideas with others like the Better Scientific Software website. You know, our idea community would love for you to share uh, your best practices with us and with others. So that is the conclusion of the first three sections. Have there been any questions up to now? Yeah, Elaine, there is a question there that uh, actually just, you know, when you were starting to talk, talk about the uh, user cases. Uh, it's a long one, actually. Actually, two questions. So the uh, transmedia learning framework and storytelling arcs are a good outline of part of how you're self-learning and engaging information in today's world. One could have this in mind when develop, developing one's own HPC products, in quotes. In other words, couldn't we implement these various self-learning tools into our plans so that the impact of our HPC software is greater? So that was one question. Okay. Um, I think, uh, first of all, I love that question. It was rather long, so I'm not sure that I, I could hear everything, but I think I heard the latter part of that question. Um, so so let, let me finish. Oh, yeah. Finish. It continues like this. I suppose some platforms would be more applicable than others. How does one get started down this path? In, order, in other words, how to prioritize which tools one should use first? Right, okay. That's a great question. So in terms of prioritizing your, if it's, it, I think that first of all, the, the way I would answer that question is different if you're prioritizing for yourself personally or if you're prioritizing for your team. So if you're prioritizing um, for yourself, I would really focus on considering being very um, pragmatic about the amount of time you have outside of what you're doing to devote to this particular learning um, opportunity. So if you are, um, let's say that you don't have a lot of time, but you do and can commit to 10 minutes per day, then what I would do is I would start by choosing some um, content that is going to, that you can start and finish within that 10 minute period. And the reason I say that is because in the beginning, what will be important is to hook yourself. You've got to hook yourself. You've got to, you've got to um, see that you can, you're starting something and you're accomplishing something. You are engaging that. You're activating that dopamine. You're rewarding yourself. You started it. You finished it. Hey, I did it. And um, that is really going to be important in the beginning, that hook. Uh, then over time, you may decide, wow, this content's really interesting. I think I can afford now to spend 30 minutes on Wednesday. Uh, and now you can engage a little more deeply. So with regard to prioritor, prioritor, oh, well, excuse me, prioritization, what I would do is think about the amount of time that I have to devote um, and which uh, modality and what content is going to allow me to start and finish it in that particular time frame uh, until I can uh, feel comfortable adding a little more time and energy to my, my task. And if I have not answered that question clearly enough, please reach out to me um, and, and I can discuss it offline. Was there another question, Ozni? Yes, actually, would you like to answer them now or finish? Or there are a few more here. Uh, Go ahead and um, go ahead and ask them now. 
So let's see. If you, uh, if you are coming at this from an from an instructor's perspective, how much do you need to educate your learners on the uh, ins and outs of the transmedia learning framework? Or is it sufficient to incorporate a handful of these different media into the learning experience and trust that it will just work out? That is a great question. Ah, uh, okay. So, the way I'm going to answer it is like this. As an instructor, the first thing to do is to realize that if you are asking your uh, learners to learn outside of the class or outside of a formal learning environment, then um, whatever you ask them to do, just know that the learner may redesign it. So, once once the learner leaves your formal environment and enters into the informal environment, they, are, they become really empowered to maximize their own learning and make it most productive for themselves. And that's really what this webinar is about. So as an instructor, I myself feel that it is most important to educate them on the uh, framework. Give them the tools to then go out and make smart choices because you will not be able to control um, how, when, what, why they learn. Um, but you can give them the, the right tools so that they can be productive and effective. And, and actually, these tools that we talked about today at a high level are the tools that will really encourage a transfer of learning. And that's what we really want. Um, you want to be able to employ these skills or these tools across many different domain areas, um, and so that ultimately will help them be more productive. There's another one here. Would you like to answer now? Sure. Okay. I see the relevance of the point, the points raised in, this, in Section 2. Two main challenges with self-learning, in my experience, are, one, first, selecting appropriate difficulty, second, engaging with others which helps me stay engaged. Any comments or recommendations? Uh, so can you repeat the, the first two again? Okay, so the, the, the two difficulties here in this, um, uh, in the, his or her experiences here. First, selecting appropriate difficulty, and second, engaging with others. Okay, got it. Challenges and stuff. Um, yeah, okay. So. I'm not sure which one is the most difficult for this particular person. I would say engaging with others. Um, okay, that could be actually really hard for some people um, on a particular topic. I think what this speaks to is trying to find a community of practice. So let's say that your topic is um, uh, Git and GitHub, and um, you find it difficult to engage with others on that topic. Uh, maybe you don't know where others are in um, your organization who who can um, help with that or who are willing and want to talk about it. I would say just try to ask uh, people that are most that are closest to you to um, introduce you to folks that that you may not know uh, to engage with on that topic. So I would actually use what social scientists call a uh, snowball sample. Um, I would start by talking to one person and having that person um, recommend others or they talk to two other people and those people may lead me, you know, down a road to finally that right person who is um, going to be able to help me. That would be number one. Uh, I think the, the other part of that question was uh, in prioritization, right? It was um, trying to find out how do I prioritize or, or finding out what, what the level of, what the right level of difficulty is? I would say that you'll know. <laughs> um, I, I feel like um, that is something that you should be, try, try to, try to answer that question for yourself on a visceral level. If, if you find yourself getting disengaged where you don't want to hear about it or it's like not interesting you, then it's probably too difficult. I've tried to, in the transmedia learning frameworks that I've provided, tried to really give you a variety of different media and a variety of, um, um, I would say, presentation and delivery methods. Some of those YouTubers are really funny. 
and the way that they approach Python, it's really engaging. <laughs> so, you know, um, I would say, uh, you know, look for look for something. If you find that you're doing, it's too hard to get started, then I would say notch it down a little bit, but try to maybe go a different route. Uh, and you might surprise yourself. So the transmedia learning framework is also meant to to provide um, ways to think outside of what we normally consider as quote unquote education. Um, to try to employ these uh, new new media uh, to to come together for you in a way that's really going to augment um, your learning experience. And and again, the most one of the most important parts of that learning experience is to activate yourself at the uh, neurological level, you know, get interested in uh, what it is that you're doing. Um, so thank you for those questions. Are there any others, Osni, or shall I continue? Yes, sure, yes. But continue, no questions, so no further questions. Okay. So here, I'm just going to conclude, and then um, we'll have some time for some more questions. All right, this is to recap. A lot of the questions that you asked earlier, I think, really fit into um, this framework. You know, we had questions about how do you prioritize? How do I know that um, when um, it's too difficult? If I'm an instructor, how, how do I help, um, how do I give my, my students the right tools to, to go out after they, they leave the, you know, the, um, the class or the structured environment and how can I expect them to carry on with their learning? A lot of the transmedia learning framework is also about augmenting what could happen in the classroom. And so here again, I really want to make the point, personally, my, my philosophy, my point of view, is that uh, learners and um, end users redesign. They, they redesign things that we've designed um, and a lot of times they end up utilizing them in new and creative ways that we never even thought of. So I would say that uh, the framework itself should be just a framework, guidelines, but by all means, if you have a different way of doing it or a better way, please share that on our um, Better Scientific Software site. So as you go forward, personalizing your own transmedia learning framework, these are the things that you may want to think about. Think about that core experience. What is it that you want to support? What is the ethos that you want to create? And what technologies are you going to use? I recommend starting with three. I would not um, make it go, uh, don't, don't make it too complex. Think about just um, working from three different technologies to see if that's something that you can handle. Um, and I, I just say that because we're all very busy and um, um, you know, it's still, it's a lot to ask to, um, to be motivated to put this together. So think about the ways that the technologies connect and extend your core experience. And by that, I mean, if you are learning Python, then um, if you choose a simulator uh, that allows you to code, um, that seems to me to be a good thing, a good way to extend and connect uh, that's a technology that extends your core experience and connects rather well. Um, Pythons, uh, or sorry, a podcast about uh, Python could be another way to extend that core experience. You may find yourself becoming much more involved and much more interested in the language uh, than you ever had been before. So what outcomes do you intend to have? What's your goal? And what actions will you take? Get, leave yourself some room for also creation of new um, unexpected results. So you may have had one goal when you started and by the end of your experience or along the way, you may realize that your goals have changed. That's okay. And will you co-create content? That would be really, it's a great idea to, um, to elaborate, but also to contribute to the community. So that, that's actually something that I highly recommend, co-creating. And then finally, how will you assess your productivity? So we know that in the process, you can self-quiz and you can assess your learning. Think about what is most productive for you. And what this, when, when you start out, it may seem like trial and error. You'll be working with a lot of different media, but then you will come to an understanding of what will make you most productive, how to use those media 
um, and those platforms together with the time that you have so that you maximize uh, your productivity. And again, you know, all of this is meant to be that scalable system for you, that where you're receiving messages about that core experience and you are being emotionally engaged, you're being engaged because you're in that reward, anticipatory and reward loop, and, um, and it's a story because it is your experience uh, that's goal-directed. So here, just some final thoughts. I think that um, I've talked about each of these except uh, really leveraging crowdsourcing. And there was a question earlier about uh, how do I um, reach out to others? Crowdsourcing is a really great way to reach out. Uh, it could be actually on a forum or a listserv, if um, that makes sense, to, to reach out, to ask questions, and then to um, get expert opinions back on either the content or um, different problems that you may have. Uh, leverage the um, Ideas ECP community and um, engage with your peers, those on your team uh, and those in the ECP community as well. And we didn't really discuss this, but this type of learning where you're uh, reaching out to people, engaging with them, learning from them, this is social learning, and the transmedia learning fam framework certainly fits into the social learning paradigm. And so when you do create your uh, plan, I certainly hope that you'll share it with us. Here are some resources for you. Uh, they have also been on each slide um, where I have mentioned a topic that we've talked about. And so I thank you very much. Hopefully now, as we've concluded, uh, you uh, are able to define what learning in the wild is and you've identified how to make your learning stick. I'm hoping that uh, you, you know why a transmedia learning framework uh, will support your productivity and how to actually create one for yourself in six easy steps. So I'm hoping that you'll go out and let us know uh, how this has worked for you. So again, Osney, Ashley, thank you very much. I've enjoyed this, and if you have any questions, please do reach out to me. There is a final question here, uh, last question. I just feel content selection is mostly through trial and error. Any benchmarking? Um, I think yes, but if you, okay. I, the way that I would benchmark uh, a lot of the content is um, by going out and looking at some of the reviews. Since so some some of the um, the media that I've suggested and some of the content constitutes like a, a different a new medium or a different way of actually um, employing this, so here definitely it, it will seem like trial trial and error. What I go out and do when I'm curating content is I look at the sources, I make sure they're credible, and um, certainly since this is a scientific community that we're dealing with, I would say to utilize uh, the skills that you have uh, in discernment, and uh, I would employ the same skills uh, when uh, looking at uh, content that you would curate uh, for, for your own learning as you move forward. And Again, if I haven't answered the question well enough and you'd like to reach out to me, I'm happy to, to talk offline. Thank you very much, Elaine.